Hi, my name is Leora Farkovitz. Uh, I live in New York City um, in the borough of Queens. I kind of grew up all over the eastern United States. I've worked in technology and small business uh, development since my late 20s, early 30s, and I worked in a technology career earlier. Um, my education is in social work and special education, trying to you know help people who've been traumatized and families recover from um, what I would now call narcissistic family abuse, but back then I just called it dysfunctional family. Um, so, you know, I spent you know most of my life trying to avoid the consequences of coming you know from that kind of legacy, and you know I failed abysmally. <laughs> just you know like everything I ever tried to do you know to to fix this um, was sort of you know woman planned and God laughed it just did not go you know the way that I hoped it would uh, uh, I think I'm you know a fairly good strategist I know I'm a good investigator <clears throat> and um, that I read facts well but you know I just had some uh, opponents I couldn't overcome um, in the form of, you know, family members who were bad actors and uh, marrying, you know, a first husband who was a bad actor. And uh, it's kind of sneaky and duplicitous. And I just am naive and did not, uh, 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 I did not properly estimate the risk that I was going through. So, um, in the 2000s, um, 2003, my ex-husband uh, sexually assaulted me and uh, in our marriage. <clears throat> he drugged me and um, he really hurt me. You know, he really hurt me a lot. <clears throat> and I was shocked. I mean, I had been with him for many, many years. I never thought he was capable of uh, that kind of criminal cruel, sadistic kind of an action. I just, this was the, the man I had loved most. You know, I followed him around the world. So when this happened, uh, I was, you know, really blown away by it. And I just couldn't, you know, I could never see it like it was his right or that he misunderstood. You know, I mean, he knew, you know, right from wrong. He knew what sexual assault is. I mean, he's, he went to law school. He knows what marital rape is and that it's illegal. Um, I didn't report it right away. I, I reported it two years later. Um, I didn't report it right away because I was embarrassed because I felt like uh, I couldn't trust the law enforcement to, um, to take action or protect me. And, um, you know, they didn't and they never do. And <coughs> um, I just felt you know, that the best thing I could do for myself and my kids was get out. So I did get out. And I thought that, um, I thought that my husband didn't love me. I didn't think that he wanted me, um, as a wife or a lover or a friend or co-parent or anything else. You know, I mean, he threatened that he would, uh, obliterate me and he, and he made good on his promise over the next 15 years. And, um, I just thought, I thought what we would do is that we would split up and that we would raise our kids the way that we had uh, intended to all along. But that isn't what happened. I mean, what happened was everything I tried to do, um, he undid. Uh, anything I tried to do to support them, educate them, provide them the best medical care, um, emotional support, creativity, whatever, you know, you know, the good things you wanted to do as a mom in the 90s for sure. And, um, you know, maybe those goals are different now. Uh, certainly everything I thought was important as an American citizen and parent was not. So uh, what ended up happening was um, we got divorced. He did things like um, he was required to get health insurance. But the order didn't specify what the deductible had to be. So he got life, you know, he got health insurance, but each deductible was $5,000 per child. So I had to be $15,000 out of pocket before I could even get any reimbursement. Um, he would not provide, you know, the cards or, 
in a timely manner or information that I needed in a timely manner. He wouldn't coordinate with me for treatment or classes or anything ever. Never would uh, cooperate with any, any objective. So it just became really not co-parenting. It became, you know, this counter parenting that, uh, he tried to make anything that was important to me there being raised with religion uh, judaism in particular because that's what we had you know embarked upon i wanted a consistent you know forward you know, training he wouldn't do it um he, he we couldn't agree on anything ever and it really wasn't purposeful in the sense of like that it was a disagreement a true disagreement on uh, methods it was really just a matter of being um, obfuscating and being oppositional it was uh, a mental disorder you know to try to alienate the children <clears throat> and um, it was very painful uh, everything to do with my kids uh, I've ended up regretting I feel so guilty for just having them <laughs> you know to have somebody and love them as much as I love my kids and see their lives uh, systemically destroyed uh, by their own family <sighs> it was so painful so you know I just thought I was the only one right and um, I was very frustrated because I had uh, confided in my husband of course you know who was my best friend for years about uh, my frustrations with my family, abuses that had happened with my dad, uh, coming in drunk and mistaking me for my mom and all of the trauma and drama and arguing and scapegoating uh, that happened, you know, because of that. And he knew, you know, that this was my Achilles heel. And what he did, I felt like the sexual assault was built around you know my father's refusal to accept responsibility consistently or to do what i needed for him to do to heal you know what had happened to me and rob knew and so he crafted uh an assault and then went to my family and claimed that i made it up uh like the same way quote unquote that i did against my dad and that was devastating because it meant that rob and my mother and my father and my sister uh, April and really not you know Laura as actively but I mean the way that Laura you know did things was to just sort of try to be Switzerland and there is no Switzerland you know um, I understand you know wanting to try to stay out of the line of fire I get it but um, the way that everybody else handled it was that I could be their scapegoat I could bury you know their their shame and their pain and um, that's the legacy I had to live so <clears throat> I thought you know my situation with Rob was unique I didn't know that there's 58,000 families a year that go through what I went through and what my kids went through uh, several million children who've been you know subjected to this sort of torturous um, psychic abuse in their homes and um, <sighs> I, I didn't know it was systemic I didn't this is a federally funded program to keep uh, fathers engaged so they'll pay child support which I don't have a problem with except that they've just completely overlooked all of the uh, science and research about what happens in um, these kind of pernicious uh, situations they don't really they don't really follow that and in some ways because um, the federal funding is five billion dollars a year it's title 4d funding it's uh, up underneath the responsible fatherhood initiative funding and it helps pay for our courts and it helps pay for programs related to addressing dysfunctional issues in family all which need to happen but it's it needs to follow the science and it needs to protect uh, people from violence and rape and incest and it's not and what I'm seeing after 10,000 hours plus of research and documentation and all kinds of these different cases what I'm seeing is sort of like this adulation of narcissism 
you know, and not really recognizing the aspects of uh, malignant narcissism that are dangerous. You know, you see malignant mar narcissism in stalking, domestic violence, incest, rape, child trafficking, human trafficking, fraud, um, any kind of covert, uh, duplicitous, sneaky, violent, pernicious, you know, behavior. And when our society, both corporately and governmentally, ignores, you know, that dynamic and the fringe, you know, parts of the bell curve, it ends up um, really costing us a tremendous amount of money. And it's not the $36 per, you know, person that we spend on, on welfare. It's the cost in productivity and happiness, you know, health and productivity in our families. So, um, initially what I thought was that this was a sign of education, um, that legal professionals didn't, didn't understand technology and that they didn't understand the disease of domestic violence or family rape, right? I felt like that they, and I kind of felt like they were willfully ignorant. Um, at first, um, I, I really did think it was just a technology issue because I, I presented all kinds of evidence and I was told because I had the capability of falsifying evidence that I had, there was no evidence of that. There was no reason that they should ignore my evidence, but they did. So I wrote this book and um, my best friend, uh, Mindy Nemoff, edited it and then she and I put together some curriculum together and we were going to uh, certify it uh, for continuing education purposes. and. You know, it sold a couple places. It sold in um, the Netherlands and in England, and it sold in um, oh uh, the U.S. Navy SEALs. A couple little places, really nothing, nothing big. But I was glad, you know, it was helpful somewhere to someone. And um, but the more I got into it, the more I realized that these state block, block uh, grants were being misappropriated. And I worked with other mothers to do research and found lots of uh, complicity and corruption and uh, RICO enterprises, money laundering, human trafficking, the normalization of pedophilia, uh, collusion, lots of corruption, tax evasion. I mean, it just, God, you know, it just went on and on and on. And I, you know, kind of had this crazy thing happen. Um, a long time ago, I got in a fight with my dad and <laughs> was going to join the Navy. So I took their test and it said that I should become a cryptographer. I never really thought about that afterwards. I mean, I, I wanted to become a SEAL and they said I couldn't because I was a girl. So I didn't join the Navy. You know, I was like, well, you're really not, you know, you really are sexist if you won't let me be a SEAL. Uh, truth be known, my heart wouldn't have been able to handle it and I didn't know it at the time, but I couldn't have physically have done that, <laughs> uh, but I never really looked into the cryptography aspect of it and that I, the fact that it was something I might be good at, but all throughout my life, I have enjoyed puzzles and I like murder mysteries. I like forensic mysteries. I like, um, Kabbalah, which is very symbolic and esoteric and cryptographic, uh, you know, cryptographic. Um, and then, you know, when I stumbled upon, um, when I stumbled upon my situation, you know, naturally, I, I lost custody of my kids. I was heartbroken. They were being destroyed. I couldn't save them. I couldn't save myself. Um, uh, I started, you know, trying, I started to notice this pattern. I noticed that I was being annihilated by my judge. I, I had gone to the judge and I asked for an emergency um, motion to be granted that my ex-husband not be allowed to leave my daughter Sydney alone with my dad because my dad was making inappropriate sexual jokes in front of her. She was seven and my boys were five and three. He was saying things that were making them ask me questions about what he meant. And I, I felt like, you know, not the end of the world, you know, but not the timing. I don't, I didn't want to squander their innocence the way that mine had been squandered. I wanted them to have appropriate conversation around them. I didn't want my dad to objectify women. And um, his third wife 
was wearing one of those whale tail thongs and it was up above her butt. She's a beautiful woman. I mean, I, they're not old, you know. I mean, they're like 18 years older than me. They were children, you know, when they had us. And <clears throat> so, I just didn't, you know, want him to objectify her. So, he wanted to go to the pool. And she said, no, it was too cold. They had had strep throat. She wanted to go to the park. And so, he started sulking that, you know, Grandma Vicky didn't want to go to the sexy uh, the pool. That she wanted to go to the frumpy park. And I just wanted to say, shut up. Just, just please shut up. I, you know, my kids are looking at me like, what do they mean? And what is the, you know, what is that? You know, pointing to her whale tail thing. And I felt so uncomfortable and I never was really allowed to set any boundaries. I had always been the scapegoat. I always was in pain about not fitting into the family and stuff. And so I was trying, you know, to fit in. I used to like break into rashes and have just the worst anxiety trying to, you know, work this out. And I have been shut out of my family since I was 14. Um, you know, they may say they love me. I, I don't, they don't treat me like they do. They don't, I don't feel loved. I don't feel protected. I don't feel, um, uh, respected or, you know, celebrated in, in any way. I, you know, there were certain things I did as a kid, you know, but as I got older, every time I tried to set a boundary, I got really just annihilated. So, um, the judge, you know, here's the motion, you know, my mother testifies that my dad had, um, molested me when I was 14. Um, and the judge says to me, you know, look, uh, just because your dad molested you when you were 14 doesn't mean um, that he's going to molest your daughter, Sydney. <laughs> I was like, are you out of your mind? I mean, I can't even uh, be conservative about what he says or does around her. It wasn't that I was saying he shouldn't ever speak to her. You know, and I know plenty of people would think that was perfectly reasonable. Um, I just wanted Rob and his wife to be there so that if he said, you know, weird, inappropriate, awkward, sexually inappropriate things that they would, um, uh, that they'd have a, a context, you know, that that wasn't appropriate, you know, from Rob and his wife, Mary. And, um, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't respect how I felt. They gaslighted me, you know, a lot about that he would leave them with the kids and then text me you know dozens of times to let me know and keep it on my mind that he was there and i really you know i tried to go no contact with him um, a number of times but every time i went no contact and i didn't refute his false allegations of parental alienation or whatever else he lied about then they would say that I hadn't provided proof that it wasn't true. So I was expected not to just ignore it and try to have a normal, lot, normal, healthy life. I had to refute it, which meant I had to stay engaged. And I had to constantly be triggered and constantly be um, re-injured, really. Um, I have, like, such layers and layers and layers of trauma over this. It's very, very painful and difficult to, to manage. And... Um, they wouldn't protect her. And so she said, you know, just because he did this to you doesn't mean he'll do it to Sydney. And I, you know, I just like all of my red flags, all of my inner alarms went ding, 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 ding. You know, something is really wrong here. So I started, you know, searching on the internet, you know, for the judge's name. And, uh, you know, I discovered that she had been appointed to a coordinating council on executive level by uh, Newt Gingrich, who was the congressman in our uh, county at that time. I was in Cobb County, Georgia. Um, she was responsible for giving hundreds of millions of dollars to the Boys and Girls Clubs of America and hadn't listed it as a fiduciary uh, responsibility um, in her campaign finance disclosure for the state of Georgia. Uh, everybody around her was letting uh, pedophiles have custody of their kids or off the hook. Uh, there was lots and lots of evidence of tax fraud, um, foreclosure fraud, money laundering, child trafficking, 
uh, child rape. Just, it was unbelievable. I, I thought I had lost my mind. I, I really thought, I, you know, like I had just woken up in some other country where, you know, judges and lawyers and um, court-appointed professionals and legislators were all perfectly okay with the fact that I had been molested or that my kids might be molested. And their attitude was that uh, I was like Kleenex. You know, I was damaged goods. There's no way for me to ever be okay. And not that they would put something in place to, you know, protect me and let me just heal or, you know, not be okay. <laughs> there's no safety net. I'm going to not be okay and there's going to be no way for me to recover or heal. I'm just going to have to die. You know, that's my option. My kids are going to die. I'm going to die. And they don't care. And I couldn't figure out why, you know, this was happening. So, um, initially thinking it was just me, I really, I found 10 different cases and each one of these cases showed a different element of the human trafficking, um, and sexual abuse orientation and this just bizarre, you know, bizarre, bizarre, bizarre outcomes. So, um, I'm going to take you through the story of each one of the significant you know pieces of the puzzle that show this um i spent 10 years under a gag order you know and the stress of keeping the secret and feeling afraid of telling it has been really hard on me psychologically and uh since christmas when uh, trump issued the um, human trafficking executive order <clears throat> Uh, that just was such an amazing thing for me because, you know, all of a sudden this news on the internet was proliferating that he was actually going to do something about these pedophiles uh, who are normalizing their conduct in the courts. And uh, I'm not the only one that's seen this. I mean, there are hundreds of people that have reported it. And um, lots and lots of evidence. It just really needs, I mean, I swear to God, if everybody that just wanted to take care of this would put $10 a month together, we could pay... Um, you know, somebody that's a part of the federal law community to, you know, file this case in, in federal court and, and fight it on our behalf. But, you know, just too uh, too much fighting and fighting and not enough communication about it. I, I hope to, that's part of what I want to be able to communicate by doing this is that there's a lot of money being wasted, uh, a lot of money being misappropriated uh, for everything that goes against what, who we are as a nation and what we believe as a nation. Um, and I want to see that change. I, I think I can show, you know, that there's money being wasted and how and, um, and what we should do to, what we should do to fix it. So, uh, right now I'm working on, uh, you know, a presentation that shows these, uh, these cases case by case and I'm going to be using a platform called WizIQ that will allow me to you can see my face and then you can see my screen you know at the same time and um, so uh, anybody that is embroiled in a high conflict custody battle with a narcissist who's trying to destroy you and your children you know I give free classes I not looking you know to make money from you. I, I can't do forensic research for people for free. I've done it before, but I just, I can't, you know, I have rent to pay. So I could teach you how to do it, you know, and document, you know, my own methodology and what I did and why. And, you know, if, if somebody ever needs to see it or use it, um, it's there, you know, that's, that's what I want to have, uh, the ability to do. So, um, if you want to reach me, my name is Leora Farkovitz. Uh, my phone number is 212-470-5441. You can text me or email me at my name, L-I-O-R-A-F-A-R-K-O-V-I-T-Z at gmail.com. And uh, so that's what we'll be, that's what we'll be doing. And uh, thanks for joining me.